The next talk is going to be beyond your cable modem, uh, how not to do DOCSIS networks. Uh, sorry, I'm not a hardware guy. Uh, but Alexander Graf is going to hold a talk, and he's done a lot on uh, virtualization and stuff other people think is too complicated. Uh, now he's going to talk about the outside of your apartment. Give him a warm welcome. Hi, and welcome to my talk, Beyond Your Cable Modem. Um, this is going to look at what's beyond the stuff you usually see at home, where you just plug in a network cable and, well, you happen to have internet available. So who am I? Um, I'm Alexander Graf. I'm usually more of a virtualization developer. I have nothing to do with hacking in my day work. I don't usually go around and hack embedded devices, usually at least. Um, but during the last year, I had a lot of spare time at night because the baby was crying. So I figured I you know, could as well spend that time and do something useful. So what happened? Um, we moved to a new home. So I, I was living in a home um, where I had DSL available. I had a real phone line. Everything was great. Um, things were just awesome. But then we moved into this new home where, where there was no DSL available. Well, there was DSL available. There were different circumstances why I couldn't use it. So instead, I figured, you know what? Try this cool new technology, internet over your cable TV uh, cable, TV cable. So I got myself a cable modem from the provider, got myself registered, and now had internet over cable TV. Also, uh, at the same time, or, uh, uh, along the same lines, I figured, why not go and also do your phone line over that cable provider with your old phone number so that people still can contact you when they want to. Now, the thing is, um, the, when I finally received the whole package, I realized, whoa, wait, something's, something's wrong here. Um, that's an analog phone line. Are we like in 2015 or is it 1994? Uh, so instead of the usual digital stuff that I'm used to, I just got myself a analog phone line. So I had to put myself another box in there that would convert the analog phone line back to a digital phone line so I could route it in my house to another line, to another machine that would then go and route it to my phone. You see the problem in there? Yeah, that, that whole stuff over there just doesn't look right, right? It, you, you, why would you go and convert something that's obviously digital? I mean, the stuff that goes into your cable is obviously digital, right? Kind of obvious. Um, and, and convert it back to analog and then back to digital just to be able to do a phone call. So I called up the technician's support and said, hey, guys, you know what? Isn't there a way I can like, directly access whatever you have there and go and use digital throughout? And the guy said, well, you know what? Actually, behind the scenes, we're all just running SIP. It's, it's just a normal SIP server. There's no, just normal voice over IP. There's nothing special about it. So if you know what you're doing, just go ahead and connect to it. <laughs> Challenge is accepted. So um, what we learned from Felix uh, earlier in this uh, car talk was, what do you do when you don't want to break your own system? Of course, you buy a new one on eBay. They're really cheap. Just go and get a cable modem, and then you can go away and well, treat it with the kind of love that you want the device to be treated with. <laughs> Turns out, my modem is actually just running Linux. Ooh, nice. It fits me pretty well. Um, and it's just a normal ARM system. There's, well, the only special thing is this big engine. But then again, I'm kind of used to ARM by now. But why not just go away and, and like, go around and, and just look at how this thing works? And well, we really just want to get this voice of IP stuff working. So take a look at how this voice of IP stuff works on the, on the device. Turns out there's actually a normal SIP. SIP uh, works on, on port 50, 5060 usually. Um, normal SIP client running on there. But this IP looks weird. So my external IP looks different, and my internal IPs all look different. And so, so what, where, where does this IP come from? So I looked at the IP list of my device and figured, well, wait, something's, something's weird there. I have a lot of IPs in there and connections that I really don't know anything about. Hmm. So down here is obviously my phone line. And up here is something else that I have no idea, oh, sorry, something else that I have no idea what this is about. So I figured, you know, let's go and dig a bit deeper and see what's actually happening there. 
<clears throat> so how does Doxus work? Um, just, this is just a, a like, small introduction and like, high-level introduction on how, how the routing runs. So basically, you have your cable modem that is connected using your uh, TV cable line um, to a CMTS, um, just a translation service, um, that then uh, takes all of the Doxus-specific stuff and just basically gives you an IP routing over into something, something, something behind it. However, it doesn't just give you one line. It actually gives you three. It gives you one line for your internet. Makes sense, right? You want to get online. That's the one you actually see when you plug into the device. It also gives you another line for voice of IP. And it gives you one more line that I would call the admin line. It's the provisioning line. Now, let's start with the admin line. That, that sounds the most interesting, right? <laughs> but what does the admin line do? Well. In the end, the modem uh, like in the Doxus network is just a normal client like in your Ethernet network. So the first thing it does when it gets online is, well, it does a DHCP request. And on the DHCP request, it goes and gets an IP address and gets all the information it needs. And uh, it also, well, it, it's kind of saying it's just a normal DHCP request. It also, however, gets um, something similar to Pixie booting, where it gets, um, usually in Pixie booting, you would get an executable that you would run. Here, you get something different. Here, you also get a file that you need to download using TFTP, just like with Pixie. However, in this case, it's a configuration file. There you go. Configuration file that you just received using Pixie to your cable modem, and then the cable modem is configured. Now, what is inside this provisioning file? That's what they call it. Well, there's interesting information like, what is your firmware update file name called if you want to update your firmware or if the provider wants to have you update your firmware? Um, how much bandwidth do I have? Um, <laughs> I, I hear people have been playing with that one. Uh, and well, since it's just a normal TFTP request, you can just do it yourself too. This is my configuration. You just go get it and you have your configuration file. Now, the interesting thing that I realized when I first started doing this was, well, sure, this is my configuration file, but what about configuration files from other people? Well, you go and get the MAC address. If you have the MAC address, you just go and get it, and there you go. You have the other people's configuration file. <laughs> Easy as that, right? That's, that's the way it's supposed to work. The actual effects of that, we're going to come to that later. So um, let's just declare TFTP, the whole access to that, as slightly insecure for now. <laughs> but now, now if, you're, if you're an ISP, you, you want to monitor what your people do, right? So imagine you're the admin there. You, you, just imagine you're, you're one of the good guys, right? Um, and, and you want to see what are those people on your modem doing? Are they like downloading too much content? Because you obviously cannot filter or find that out from the other side. Um, so what do you do? Well, you obviously send the industry standard for that an SNMP request using a password that only you know. <clears throat> send it over to the cable modem, and the cable modem then goes in and replies uh, with the respective reply saying, oh, yeah, sure, I'm, I got this piece of information. There you go, you have it. Um, oh, that was too quick. Ooh. So, um, but how does, uh, how does your modem actually verify that password? Yeah, you guessed right, using the provisioning file, obviously. So <laughs> once you download the provisioning file from any random modem in there, including yours, uh, you end up getting an interesting password. All right. However, one, one, they actually did at least one thing. They uh, limited the address range you're allowed to access those devices on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As a hint for those who did not clap, this means everybody who's in that network. But, but how big is this network? So um, I figured, you know, why, why not just give it a try and ask some people in Hanover whether I could just get their MAC addresses 
and see you know, how, how far I could get. Just send an SNMP request over. I had the password now, right? And, and ask that modem, please tell me everything you know. And it replied. <laughs> There's a lot of interesting information in SNMP. You wouldn't believe it. So this is obviously just general stuff like, oh, yeah, and this and that modem. But there's more in there. There's, for example, um, this is my public IP address, in case you're searching for someone specific. Or these are my internal MAC addresses and IP addresses, in case you're searching for some specific notebook that someone stole from you or so. <laughs> or this is my provisioning file in case you just happen to port scan all of the machines out there and ask them using the same password that they all share uh, on what their provisioning files could be called. <clears throat> of course, I never did that. Right? <laughs> so, well, I would say the whole SNMP story isn't really all that secure either. Yeah. But at a certain point in time, like when the modem actually doesn't work like the way you would envision it to be, or if you just need to do more administrative stuff, the admin wants to have more access than just SNMP, right? It's just kind of isolated to a specific, few specific pieces of information. Now you, you want some more hardcore access, like we'll go down into a real shell. How do you do shells in 2015? Telnet, exactly. <laughs> We'll actually get to the point why Telnet was a good idea later, but um, <laughs> that's 30 slides down or so. Um, so, well, we already managed to get an SNMP connection working to a different modem. Let's, let's just try the same with Telnet and see you know, where, how, how far we can get. Well, we can go in and uh, just Telnet in, and it replies and says, please give me a login. Hmm. Now, where, where do I get this login from? Well, uh, turns out the administrator needs to provide that password just the same to the modem, which needs to verify it based on configuration, which it gets from the provisioning file that I think you see the point. Um, so in the same provisioning file that you can obviously, again, download for every single user in the network, uh, you also have the password in plain text. That's the part that actually took me the longest in this whole thing. Uh, I, I spent weeks trying to figure out what hash this is. <laughs> so if we try to log into the server using those credentials we got, yeah, we, we get greeted with a nice command line interface for poor Mr. Admin at uh, our provider's site. But I don't really like those like, boiled down interfaces. I, I want a real shell. Right? I want to load kernel modules. I want to filter all my network traffic. I want to uh, reroute everything the modem does to a different machine. I want to rewrite the voice of IP client to instead do either way. Um, so I want to do something real, right? So let's do the help command. And it tells us that there's a cool command called shell. <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go. Oh, good to shell. So by now, at that point, I can actually go and do anything I want with that modem. I've got full root access. By the way, all the modems run every single like, piece of software running on there, including your web server and your SIP server and anything as UID 0, which is a good idea, right? So <laughs> I, I now got shell access, so I can do anything I want. I can reroute all your traffic. I can, well, I don't, obviously, but this is, this is basically where we were at half a year ago. Another thing to note is that since it's so annoying to generate different passwords for different devices, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. You just use one password for all, right? It's good enough. So you don't even have to read your other person's file, your other person's configuration file, the provisioning file. You can just use your own password that is in your own provisioning file, which you already have on your modem because you provisioned yourself. <clears throat> the only notable exception that I found to this whole scheme, so uh, you manage, I mean, you could basically go and log into any modem out there, except for Fritz boxes. <laughs> yep. 
Congratulations to that one. Kudos. So apparently AVM are the only ones who did not follow the standard scheme from uh, my provider and instead said, no, 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 guys, you, you don't do the firmware. We do the firmware. And they just don't like to enable Telnet. Apparently there are people in, there, in that company that actually know what they're doing. <laughs> so, um, well, I would say the whole Telnet access thing isn't exactly, I, I, I wouldn't mark it secure either. Nah. Nah. But, we didn't really come here for the admin network, right? It was just, it just happened to be around, and I just looked at it, and meh, <laughs> meh. We, we wanted to go and do voice of IP. Ha! Yeah, so how does voice of IP look like? Well, it's kind of similar. It also does a DHCP request in the beginning. DHCP is usually fine. Um, I, I mark it with a green tick here. It's, uh, yeah, I'll leave it to others to further dig down into that part. Um, it does the same TFTP bit, so if you just go and instead of downloading your, uh, your provisioning file from your own modem into, like, from, from, from a modem, from, from the run, from the admin network, you just go and uh, get it from the other part, from the other MAC address, and there you go, you have it. Um, nicely enough, uh, all those cable providers uh, registered consecutive MAC addresses, so if you have one, you also have the others. Yeah. You basically just ask a friend, give me your MAC address that's written on the box, and you basically have everything you need. Um, SNMP is the same thing. You can access it using SNMP. The really nice thing about SNMP here is that the box also tells you the other accesses it has. So if you only have one IP address, or they also have a nice DNS service internally that tells you what the host IP address is to a certain MAC address. So you just ask the DNS for the MAC address of the modem, of the, of the voice of IP access. Then you go on SNMP, access uh, the, uh, go, go on SNMP, ask it for the IP address of the admin network, and there you go, you in the box. Uh, however, the really interesting bit on the voice of IP network is SIP, since, well, you're doing voice of IP, right? That's, that's what the whole thing is about. So voice over IP basically works your, the way that your modem wants to go and do a phone call. So how do you do a phone call with SIP? Well, you need to provide data, like credentials, like tell the modem, tell the other side, the server, how you authenticate yourself, which obviously is written in your provisioning file. So uh, you use those, you tell the server, I want to do a phone call, and there you go, you do a phone call. Now, if we look at this provisioning file, you can see that it contains your server and your username and your phone number and your well, basically everything you would need to log in into an SIP server. Now, since I can read anybody else's provisioning files, hmm. So, <laughs> so imagine I'm this user up there, right? And I, I'm just doing a normal call as this phone number up there. Well, maybe there's this other guy on the network who just goes in and downloads your provisioning file, and oh, he gets all the credentials he would need, so he gets the same phone number, and then he can just go and do a call. Hmm. Yeah, maybe I should have registered a few 0, 0900 numbers. Um, Now, the really interesting part there is what, it also works the other way. You register for it, and if you're the fastest one registering it, uh, the other modem, well, doesn't get the chance to receive calls, which means now you receive the calls, and then you can just tell the other modem that there was a call, just that by now you actually route all the traffic through your modem, and you can listen to all the voice data that there is on the line. Yay! Yeah. Uh, not sure it would be a good idea to talk to your lawyer about uh, either way. Uh, using this line for secure stuff is probably not the best. I wouldn't mark SIP as secure on this thing either. But at this point, so, so on, the, on the Telnet access and on all the other parts, I was like, sure, I can, I can fix it for myself. I'm, I'm an egoist, right? Um, I, I, can, I can fix it for myself. I don't care about the rest of mankind. Uh, I do, but... I can claim that. Um, so I can just as well ignore all the others and say I fix it for myself, but for voice of IP, I can't because I'm completely out of the loop. This, this other guy, he could just go and steal my credentials because he can. 
and there's nothing I can do about it. So uh, at that point, I was kind of scared that someone would be able to hack me. So I started to think about how to fix this thing. Now, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously you go and you as a user go and pick up the phone and call the service line from your provider. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> nah, nah, I didn't, didn't want to go down that road, nah. So instead, I figured I'm, I'm going to call someone else. I'm going to call a couple friends. <laughs> I'm going to call a couple of friends from, uh, from Heiser. Thanks to my Linux work, I, I knew a few of those. Um, and uh, they also tend to do security, which kind of falls into this whole thing, and use them as a proxy. So um, that nobody could actually go and sue me until things were public. <clears throat> so imagine uh, what, what the provider would do when he hears that uh, I hacked into their Telnet account. Sure, you do the obvious thing. You replace Telnet with SSH, right? It's, it's what everybody would do. It's the first thing you look at this and think like, oh my god, this is 2015. Why would you be doing Telnet? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Um, <laughs> take a look again. It's, it's not as, as simple as you think. It's, take a look again at this provisioning file. SSH actually gets different credentials. So the SSH credentials are actually down here. And the password is different from the one on the top. I don't know what the password is, but I can tell you that the password hash is really cool. So the password hash is something that comes from VxWorks. So I'm pretty sure that there are more devices out there that might be interesting to look at. Um, the VxWorks hash basically works in a really simple way. It creates a checksum of your input that lies somewhere between those two numbers, and then creates a fancy string out of them uh, based on some heuristics. But essentially, the whole password down there boils down to just a single number that's basically in a realistic case. The, the upper limit is 40 characters, so you're not going to see a password that long. Realistically, you, you basically check around 100 passwords, and any, any hash out there, any password that's available, you already cracked it. Which means there are so many collisions in this hash, which I wouldn't even call a hash, um, that I don't know what the original password is like. like I don't know. But this one works pretty well. <laughs> So we go ahead and we log into this machine and we type in our colli co collision and yeah, yeah, there you go, you got the same thing as before. So we told them again, guys, look, it's not as easy as that. You should probably take a bit deeper breath and take a look at how things actually are broken. Which turns out they did. So what happened next? Um, we had this whole huge mess with lots of services that are all available, all attackable, and everything is just horribly broken. Um, that was two months ago. Uh, yeah, there were some circumstances why we just couldn't tell them earlier. Um, and uh, in that, we basically told them, guys, you know, in, in two months' time, we're going to do a talk here, and everything's going to be public, so you maybe want to fix your network until then. So the first thing that they did is um, they added a check to their TFTP server to verify whether you were actually eligible to download this provisioning file. <laughs> so now you can only download your own provisioning files, which is great, finally. I mean, this is the obvious thing to do. So that one's fixed. Then they go, went ahead and said, well, there's no real reason why one modem should do SNMP traffic with another. So they just added a firewall saying, we're blocking SNMP traffic between different machines. Problem solved. <laughs> the same for SSH. They went ahead and said, there's no reason why you should be, doing, why you should be doing TCP between one modem and another. Problem solved. And because the, uh, the voice of IP access credentials are actually part of your provisioning file, which you can now no longer download from somebody else, that one's fixed too. Awesome. So go ahead, go ahead, clap. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, ISP. So after two months, I actually managed to 
limit me into the borders that I was supposed to be in the beginning. It's cool. So what do you have? Um, please guard your networks. Even if you believe that somebody couldn't go in, they probably will. Because as soon as a customer can access your device physically, which well, kind of happens to be the case with a modem that's sitting in your in your apartment, uh, that guy can access your, your network. There's no way you can, you can prevent it. So don't believe that the border of your network is the home. The border of your network is the cable going into that home. <clears throat> the same way goes the other way around. If an ISP gets your device, don't trust that thing. Seriously, they can do anything they like, and sometimes somebody else can do. Um, so in this case, uh, according to my provider, I was able to access three million devices. Quite some number. <laughs> also, the press is your friend. If you are afraid of revealing something, tell someone who can do it for you, and eh, usually things go out well. Let's hope for the best. And then this whole thing went online uh, beginning of the week. Uh, and uh, there were a couple of questions on the forums that I read, and I just wanted to take the time to reply to those. So first thing that always comes up is, is this a conspiracy? Like, oh my god, this is the NSA backdoor. No way. I mean, seriously, those guys are not as stupid. They, they have their own front doors. They don't need the back doors. This, this really is just a case of, if we don't secure things, it's going to be easier for us. Eh. Well, it was easier for everybody, including the ones who shouldn't have access. So, no, this is not a, this is not a conspiracy. This is not some backdoor from some agency. This is really just a matter of a company not doing their homework. The same thing goes for other providers. Uh, my cable just wasn't long enough to connect to some other country. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know whether other DOCSIS networks are affected. From the best of my knowledge, yes, they are. <laughs> I'm not allowed to tell you to check, but if you happen to have that idea on your own, <laughs> no animals were hurt during the production of this movie. All the passwords were changed. So if you happen to know the real passwords, you probably had a good laugh during the presentation. If you don't know the real passwords, yeah, they're different. To the best of my knowledge, all of that knowledge that I just gave you is completely useless to you because all the issues are fixed. Thank you. So now we can go for questions, uh, if you like. So please, or you go ahead and announce it. So if you have questions, run towards a microphone and stand behind it visibly. Uh, the first one was on number four. Yeah, you were talking about uh, taking a couple of weeks to get to know that it was, the password wasn't hashed, but plain text. So how long did this whole exchange in total go on? How, how, how much face palming and how many hours did it take for you? So I didn't spend full time on it. I really literally just, whenever the baby was crying, I just went up and figured I can do something. Um, it's not, I basically got cable access two years ago. Okay. Um, I first got into the modem about one year ago, I think. That's when I started looking for real and, well, it's, it, I basically ended up digging deeper and deeper, right? It's, it's not like voice of IP, for example. I only realized the whole voice of IP story in, say, August or so, since I just didn't look before. I was like so excited to see all the other bits. <laughs> <laughs> just didn't look. Now, um, number one, please. Um, are you really sure that the TFTP um, provisioning file fetching is secure now? Because do they do some Mac integrity tests or Mac spoofing? And okay. Uh, 
The problem is the law, right? I'm, I'm not allowed to tell you to try it yourself. I'm not allowed to tell you that I don't think that anything on the physical layer is insecure. I'm not allowed to tell you that, I mean, there's so many things I'm not allowed to tell you about this whole network. Okay. I haven't tried. Uh, I really just went in and said, TFTP fetch and see whether I can get it. Number seven up there on the balcony. Uh, hello. Um, my question is in the beginning in your config files, I think there was something about uh, traffic priority or network priority as well. Did yep. you play around with that one as well? Is that something about net neutrality maybe? Ah, that's an interesting. Okay, so it's not about net, net neutrality at all. Um, it's about uh, QoS of different services. So they uh, basically say that um, voice of IP traffic gets. Uh, higher priority than the other bits, since you want to have low latency on voice of IP traffic, obviously. So there's nothing with net neutrality in this thing at all. I did play around with uh, those settings, um, just because, uh, coincidentally, right the day after the far plan got released, um, my account got throttled to 80 kilobits. <laughs> I don't know why. Could be related, could maybe not. But um, I, I figured I'm paying for 100 megabits, so I should probably get 100 megabits and started to look at those things. I did not manage to actually convince my modem to get me more. Did you change so the bandwidth in the settings? Yes. Because no yeah. dialogues, please. I, I did change the bandwidth. Uh, it's not. My guess is they're also QoSing on the other side. But if you want to verify it, I'm not telling you not to. <laughs> Number two. Please. Yes, so at first, thank you for the nice insights. Um, I am a Kabel user, so I'm interested here. And I want to again make a statement on the provisioning file. Um, you should have told them that a provisioning file fetching in this way isn't a good idea anyway. And I personally would believe if they do not can transfer it via a completely different channel, it will not get uh, really secure. They cannot do it differently because it's part of, part of the standard. There's a DOCSIS standard, which all the modems have to adhere to, and that's part of the standard. They, they cannot do it differently. If you want to have it done differently, you have to tell the DOCSIS standardization committee, which is in India. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so talk to that. Thanks. <laughs> now we'll have a question from the internet. Um, could two modems uh, be programmed to talk uh, among uh, themselves directly, bypassing the uh, ISP firewall? Say it again. Uh, could two modems be programmed to talk um, among themselves directly, bypassing the ISP firewall? You mean with the new scheme or with the old scheme? With the old scheme, it was uh, just available. You could just go and, and route through it. With the new scheme, <sighs> you, not with the official modems. And number eight on the balcony. Did you find uh, any traces of TR69 in this thing? I did in, uh, on the AVM boxes that were secure, yeah. So that was the only bit that actually ended up making a lot of sense. Um, TR69 is a pretty nice standard. You basically have uh, authenticated, I think it was even HTTPS traffic, that basically goes and pokes uh, the server to get you uh, a firmware update. It, it's a perfectly nice uh, way of provisioning such a system. It's definitely a lot different from the usual way. So um, on those DOCSIS modems, the usual way to tell it to get a new firmware is either to tell it to reboot and get a new file from the provisioning server, or to just poke directly to SNMP, tell it, go to this TFTP server over there with this file name and flash it onto your flash. <laughs> no, I have not tried to spoof the, the, the privileged IP address range. Now it's number four again. Um, the question I have is um, when you try to first contact them via Heiser, uh, was there any way they might have tried to convince you to not do the talk? And if so, would there be an itch on your head? They did not try in any way whatsoever. Zero. 
do you think that was due to the credibility or do you think they thought, oh, we screwed up? I don't know. Um, I don't think they thought any other way would work at that point in time. Since the press is already involved, they're not going to pull back their story. There's nothing else they can do. Thank you again. Um, before I hand the microphone, do you want to do the entire 24 remaining minutes Q&A or do you want to put a limit to it? No, I think 24 minutes Q&A is fine. We can always cap it later on, right? It's, yeah, just okay, go ahead and ask. So ask as much as you like. <laughs> the internet again. Um, how much of this would be possible? Uh, would have been possible if the modem uh, had been in bridge mode? My modem was in bridge mode. <laughs> and number six. Do you have an idea how long uh, this has been that way? And do you have any specific reasons to believe uh, what uh, proportion of, uh, or what group of people might have abused these, uh, these problems? So I don't know, since I, don't, I, I did not see anybody else on the network, but it's really hard to see somebody in a sea of three million devices. Um, I am not aware of anybody exploiting this. Uh, so I can only stay, state what Vodafone said, and they said that nobody else did exploit those problems. Um, according, as, far, as far as time, and I believe them on that one, actually. It's, it's, I don't think anybody did, which is surprising, since this whole stuff was kind of obvious. But apparently nobody thought of digging into their modem before. Um, the one thing that uh, about the timing is uh, apparently they already cover Deutschland, basically uh, already does internet for 10 years by now. And there's very little reason to believe it's been different in the beginning. <laughs> so it was probably vulnerable for about 10 years. Um, that said, in the beginning they were not even using Doxis 3. Um, which did not really do real encryption, so at the end of the day, you could just do whatever any race on the network back in the day. By now, it's only halfway complicated. Now, in number one. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk, too. Um, so, it's completely possible that they, they may have not found out that somebody else accessed this before, and maybe already flashed a lot of devices with another firmware which is still listening to his commands in the, with the new setup because he changed the firmware. They did, the, they did not, okay, they did update the firmware at that one point in time when I showed that they switched to SSH. They did not change the firmware ever since. So all the services that I was talking about, they are still running on your modem. Okay, but they can't be sure that there is another firmware by somebody else on, on routers running oh. now. If, if, if somebody else maybe before thought of making a botnet be before all this came up in the last five years or ten years yeah. and, and already controlled some devices and they can't be sure that their current firmware is now running on those devices. There no. can be still devices somewhere controlled by somebody sure. else. Sure, I mean you, you have to obviously fake all the information they receive from the modem pretty well otherwise they get you onto the security block that I'm on. Um, but. Uh, if you do that correctly, you can probably just replace all the film pieces of firmware, just ignore all the updates, and try to behave the same way as they would expect and hope that nobody finds out. Uh, it's entirely possible. I don't think it's very likely, but it's definitely entirely possible. Let's hope there are no more networks like this one out there um, from now on. Usually, there are no second questions, so uh, we still got comfortable time, but uh, try to limit yourself to one question. Now it's number two. Uh, have you tried to change your MAC address on the DOCSIS level or also for the DHCP request or how do they do authentication of the modem in the network? So the authentication works using uh, certificates. Um, I I'm actually not sure, I haven't read the standard on that side, um, whether the MAC address is part of the certificate, I don't know. Um, if it's not, you can easily just change it. Uh, I haven't tried. But then again, the, the modems are what, eight euros? Number seven. What other, what, other, what other recommendations do you have if someone were to have a suspicion about a vulnerability um, for the research part and for the disclosure part? 
What do you have to do? Um, well, I, I can't give you any legal or any advice on that one. Um, I can tell you that uh, getting somebody involved that has done this before is a really smart idea because they've gone through a lot of pain points. Um, the press is even better because they have a really, really big lever. Nobody wants to be in the press for two months or whatever just on negative news that there was somebody who was legitimately trying to tell them to improve the network and they sued them. Uh, so there's a really good chance that uh, going via the press is going to keep problems away from you, but there's no guarantee. Right? Um, I, I cannot give you real, I mean, legal or any coherent advice on that one. Uh, I would, I mean, if I would find such a thing again, I would definitely go the same route. I would just call up Heiser and tell them, and it, would, it went pretty smoothly. And I mean, the, the really cool thing is they actually listen to the press. If I had gone to the service, they would have just said, sorry, I have wrong number, I, I can't help you. Now the internet. Um, how did you obtain the original data? Did you use JPEG, uh, JTAG or dump the device firmware and run it virtualized? Uh, not sure how much of that I should actually tell everybody. Um, let's say I we placed the, you can actually see this on the, on the slide, right? Um, oh my god, this is going to take forever. Um, okay, where's my mouse cursor? There it is. Okay, so I got a picture of the modem here. There you go. So um, what you can see here, down the, the white and the yellow cables, those are the serial port. Uh, and the IDE cable up there, that's where the flash chip was you, before I started fiddling with the modem. Um, now the flash chip is actually in that socket up there, which means I could swap the flash chip between a device I own, BeagleBoom Black, for example, has a really nice spy interface that you could just use to write those, um, and then uh, plug it back into the modem. So I could replace the firmware, uh, and get myself an initial shell. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, I really do not like to lose internet access. Uh, so this is not the modem that I was actually using uh, at home. Uh, instead, I just used that modem to fetch a firmware image so I could then look at, see whether there might be other bugs that you could use. Now number eight. Um, earlier you've said that uh, who was it? Fritzbox uh, was more secure and they didn't have the same uh, vulnerabilities. Do you think they simply uh, didn't use hard coded passwords and stuff? So, do you think they would be uh, vulnerable to similar attacks and that someone probably, like you wouldn't tell them, but maybe they should look into it? Or do you think it isn't possible and someone should, like, prove you wrong? From, from all I can tell, but this is, I mean, just a gut feeling that I get from looking at the different firmware files. Um, the usual way, at least the Linux-based firmware works on those systems, is that um, there's TI creating a BSP, then they give it out to Motorola, then Motorola gives it out to CBN, then CBN gives it out to, uh, to Kabel Deutschland, and then each party of those adds a few pieces of, of stuff. Um, that's the usual way it works in those, those devices. Um, Whereas in the AVM boxes, things looked vastly different. There was one firmware image that even contained information for some Austrian provider. Um, so instead of giving uh, like full control to the cable provider, AVM kept control on their own and actually audited the stuff they were doing. That's the major difference. One more question from the internet. Uh, do you know if they still use unencrypted uh, zip? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing in the protocols changed at all whatsoever. They really just added a few firewall, firewalls. So once you're on the physical layer, you can read everything you like. Yeah. Well, and you break through the DOCSIS encryption, obviously. Now the newly adjusted number two. Thank you. Um, mine is not so much a question as I'd like to uh, add some insight and perspective to this. I have myself worked for several uh, ISPs, and um, the, we, I've actually worked for an ISP that had not this particular issue, but a similar issue. And the, the way that it was fixed, and 
you can look me up. I have worked for several ISPs. You don't know which one had this problem. But what, <laughs> what the, was actual, the, actually the fix was a simple IP check. So once you downloaded the, the TFT, from the TFTP server, uh, it was just checked if you did it from the IP that was uh, suspected. So this issue may actually be reproducible if you can somehow get hold of an, uh, an IP you weren't supposed to have, like, say, spoof uh, MAC address or something like that. Um, that being said, I would like to attach a comment to the, uh, the whole uh, SIP thing, too. Uh, you indicated that it would be possible to silently intercept um, conversations, which is not necessarily uh, the issue because many uh, SIP servers can be configured to allow multiple endpoints. So as the, uh, the uh, what you call the bad guy would be able to pick up your calls, you would also hear your phone calling yourself. <clears throat> right, and if your phone picks up within 0.0 and .0 one microseconds, then uh, yeah, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. It just drinks again. Uh, that's that's the point about it. Um, also, the other bit that uh, you have on the on the SIP server is that uh, that particular server actually only allowed one endpoint to be registered at a time. Yeah. At least from what I could tell, was some Huawei box. I don't know. Number three, please. Um. Yeah, um, I attended this talk today because um, I know that the, um, at the beginning when Doxys was introduced, the modem were asking uh, for the configuration file also with the Ethernet ports, <laughs> which is great. And um, my question is, um, is there a way within the Doxys standard so that uh, ISP can verify their hardware? I mean, you, uh, you have seen, uh, I've seen the, the, the the type and the vendor name and the SNMP, but you can ob obviously spoof that. Um, um, of course, firmware binaries won't run on the f uh, f wrong hardware, um, but... I, I'm not quite sure I'm getting what you... Um, the question is, you. is the weight c control for the, for the ISP, um, which hardware there is they are using? <laughs> so, so I come from a virtualization background. And in my world, there's no such such thing. It okay. doesn't exist. <laughs> if if you, you if you can somehow abstract it, you can abstract it. Okay. Eight, please. Hi. Um, I wanted to add on the part with the max spoofing because I had a modem like that like five years ago, and I actually I never went inside the modem. But I had some applications where I needed a new IP address in a short period of time. <laughs> 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 um, and I remember that actually the thing, if you, you told the, the modem your, IP, uh, your MAC address, a different MAC address, you got different external IP addresses back then. I don't know if things have changed because it was five years ago, but yeah, after what I've heard from you, I'm kind of unsure that things changed. No, I'm, I'm fairly sure this is actually accurate. Um, from what I understand, I never did that myself, but I heard from people who did. Um, the MAC address check and the certificate check are actually separate. So that um, if you own a valid certificate from some random dude who happens to actually pay for the service, uh, then and you get that certificate uh, and you're not on the same CMTS as that guy, then you can actually go and, uh, well, basically say that you are him, even if you have a different MAC address, which then again implies that if you change your MAC address, you can just be somebody else, which then again implies that maybe you can actually go and get somebody else provisioning files, yeah? Yeah, well, <laughs> not up to you. Not going to try it out. Number two, please. Yeah. Uh, you had this one with uh, one particular provider, and I happen to know that there's a second provider using the same technology in Germany. Were they somehow involved in this loop? I mean, it took Kabel Deutschland two months to fix this, and... No, yeah. but they better hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And Quite frankly, I do not believe that this is limited to Germany at all whatsoever. So, yeah. 
Let's see who's faster. Uh, all right, end of questions, right? Or is there yeah, any? it looks like we're at the end of questions. The internet, maybe? No, internet doesn't have any questions. <laughs> there are eight empty microphones. So thank you very much for your talk, and thank you very much for the <laughs> Q&A.